some kind of chemical reactions going on. Hello everyone, I am Kyle Montgomery, I'm here with Cooper Carr and Neil Anderson. This is episode 14 of the Cinepile podcast and we have a special episode for y'all tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, All of our episodes are special, let's be honest. (laughs) (laughs) But which kid do you love the most? (laughs) This one is very near and dear to my heart though because I love both of these films. One of these films is Kyle, kind of a, is Kyle. It's kind of the child of the other. It's kind of like Kyle. It's kind of like like Kyle. Kyle. Gosh, if only it were true. Integrity. (laughs) Yeah, I inspire to these films. One of them is last year's Best Picture winner. With the Academy Awards approaching, we thought it would be appropriate to visit last year's Best Picture winner, which was Spotlight. Something Cooper and Neil hadn't actually seen up until we prepared to research for this episode. Mm -hmm. So we paired Spotlight with the quintessential investigative journalism film, All the President's Men. There's a lot of similarities, a couple differences, but we're going to break them both down and see why they register so well with their audience. What is it about these movies that just brings us in? Well, the funny thing is, is we initially were thinking about doing a political film episode mm-hmm. with you know the inauguration and trump becoming president uh this idea was a little while ago obviously when the inauguration happened but um we watched all the president's men and realized that it wasn't the direction we wanted to go wasn't a political episode anymore we thought pairing it with another journalistic or like a process um movie mm-hmm. was better so yeah we paired it with spotlight yeah, because originally I had wanted to pair it with Oliver Stone's Nixon, Nixon which yeah. is one of my personal all-time favorite movies. But it just, Spotlight is such a better combination. Mm-hmm. Because part of the beauty of these films, part of the beauty of these lone wolf journalists and what they represent is that they're apolitical. Right. They're isolated from politics. You don't see any politics in All the President's Men Except for on television. Yeah, it's kind of like they're like the monks of the modern era, you know. <laughs> you know, they they can like because because well, journalists are supposed to walk this like weirdly pure line of like you know I can't reveal a source. This is on and off the record. They have a lot of morals that dictate stuff whether or not they should or shouldn't reveal something. You know, it's um it's it's a profession that still has that that core of integrity to it that like that uh, that it, it can't be you know it just it has to, it has to maintain itself as being unflappable other words it just becomes cataclysmic it's a self-regulated estate of the government but right it's the like the state it's yeah. the fourth estate that isn't regulated the same way obviously as the other three are you know with like lawyers integrity and what they can do like what you were just saying like revealing sources and stuff and it's like well i can't reveal my source you know but that's internal like mm-hmm and thankfully, it's also protected. Right. So to take it even a step further, one of the fine lines that they really have to, they really have to walk in our modern day political climate is the opinion piece. It needs to be unbiased. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, well, today it's much different than what it was. Opinions are facts. During all the president's men, right? Yeah, During the 70s. it's very different. And with the proliferation of all these opinion pieces and talking heads, it and really is a problem and... to tell some of these things apart. And that is kind of why it's even more valuable now. And this, honestly, what we're talking about kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the network, too, a little bit, and how this kind of happens to news where it where, becomes entertainment. Where you're fighting others for ratings. You no, know, the, network, before, the network, the HBO show? No, the Sydney Lumet film. Oh. Yeah, the 1970s. Oh, that's the newsroom. I don't know what year. Sorry. Yeah, not newsroom. Uh, the network. 
Yeah, it's like the black comedy. Oh, it's... right, right, right. Okay, sorry, I totally forgot about that. Newsroom yeah. does kind of go hand in hand with this as well, though. Does, if y'all yeah. watch that, mm-hmm. because it's way more on the nose and cinematic about it, kind of to a fault. Yeah, it's a little more austere, but that's kind of well sort, less. That, it's sort of less thinning. austere. All the president's men and these kind of things are austere. They're like unflappable. They don't make things dramatic. They just let them speak for themselves. Yeah, the movies themselves are like journalism. You know, yeah. they're documentary. They're narratives. They're not documentaries, but no. they are meant to feel real. Like even the color doesn't draw attention to itself, right? They don't. Mm-hmm. Like you don't. A documentary is not something you color grade heavily, right? You kind of take the the realness out of it. Mm-hmm. And these yeah, but- films were the same way. Tom Poole colored Spotlight and it looked mm-hmm. great. And honestly, that kind of look is almost more difficult than a very that stylized look. look. But it was very neutral. It was very, mm-hmm. you didn't draw attention to itself. Right? No, it didn't. But it still, everything looked it was good. Be- beautiful shade of, of right. beige. Yeah, it was very yeah, beige. beige. Yeah, it was like, but it was beige. I mean, I think Kyle said it was more so golden at some times. But it was, you know, red, green, blue, yeah. and beige. Th- th- that was like the thematic motifs of everything but it but I, never heavy well um, never yeah, and, never like they were taking muted. your eye off of what the no story yeah it was, was always like right? in the it was always to the was point like, that like, what, um, what you saw on screen was what you were supposed to see right like, what you were like a dish towel would be blue sure yeah and, and and i don't know i thought they did such a great job of maintaining the thematic um colors overall for it and i don't know and it just uh it was like how we were talking about the the last what was it uh, when we were talking about La La Land mm-hmm. and how it's so great because everything works together so well in concert, even though it's on that, you know, that red lining kind of right. level. Very and, saturated. Yeah, and just bomb- very... the, the bomb- bombastic like quality of film like that, that would definitely be La La Land. This is like that subtle, like maintaining drone that is like beautiful and consistent. And that, that's what I really liked about Spotlight. And then also Mark Ruffalo, extremely good job with acting uh batman did a wonderful job too <laughs> still seeking justice is wonderful i mean took a back seat i don't know why people didn't understand birdman that. birdman <laughs> he's birdman now he's bird, he's everything. <laughs> i know he's but, is, and, but he's birdman and, to me and, now and to, to, to further let's, kyle's talk, yeah, let's point, talk about the characters yeah to further kyle's point when uh talking about um remind me what is that actor's name one more time because i'm gonna talk about him. michael keaton michael keaton thank you so when keaton is so many times just reeling back Mark Ruffalo. He's like, no, we got to go. We got to go. We got to go. We, you know, we got to protect these kids. We got to let these, the, the whole people know that this is a problem. And Keaton had, Keaton's character had enough, you know, uh, coolness to go, no, 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 no. That's not how journalism is done. Like, yeah, you're wanting to win the battle. I'm trying to win the war. Let's take down the whole system. Let's do this by the books. Let's be smart about it. Let's cross all our T's, dot all our I's. And that's what was really great to to watch, that it wasn't something that was just this, you know, reactionary, you know, instinctual kick of, you know, trying to get, like, that, that quickest satisfaction. It was, no, I'm going to be a tactician and bring down everything. And it made the ending so much more rewarding rather than, you know, obviously what Mark Ruffalo's conclusion wanted to be for the movie. But, um, but yeah, so the yeah, cast yeah. And, and the whole were great. Yeah, I think talking about characters is probably a good idea now. Um, so yeah, in general, if we start with Spotlight. They were, in general, almost perfect human beings. Like, in the movie, uh, for what we saw them. We don't see their private lives, almost at all. You get a couple glimpses. But for the, the most glimpse, part... The glimpses you do get are... In a way, cliche, but they're also honest because they just dedicate themselves to their work. Right. So their mm-hmm. personal lives are always taking the back Secondary. seat. Just yeah. like in the story. Maybe you do get some glimpses or some details here and there. Maybe she's married. Maybe somebody's divorced. Mm-hmm. That's not what defines them as people. Right. In this movie, they're defined by their practically ideals, what we were saying before, right? They're like bigger, they're almost larger than humans right they represent virtues ideals yeah that that we all should you know hope for in journalism and you know strive for like in general as people for Mm. seeking truth and seeking facts seeking facts 
stopping injustice. And yes, exactly. They're heroes, basically. Yeah, they They're are heroes. heroes. Mm -hmm. And if you were to go to any character building school or blog, they're all going to tell you, and for the most part, or they're usually they're usually right about this, they're going to tell you that your character needs a flaw. In Mark Ruffalo's case, he's the only one that really comes to mind for me. His flaw is impatience. Mm -hmm. He wants to go ahead with the story, even if it's what his intentions are honorable. He doesn't see the bigger picture in that moment because he's so impassioned. I was going to say impassioned, maybe more than impatient. It's yeah. just more like he... Whereas like Michael Keaton is almost like the veteran. Yeah, he's, you know, the, he's the experience yeah. that's like the old breed. He's the old breed, right? I've got a question though. Yeah. How much of Michael Keaton's reserve came from himself? Granted, he is a veteran. His character is a veteran and this person is a veteran in journalism. Not actually a veteran, but like, yeah, yeah veteran, yeah, in, veteran in, in journalism. Industry. But uh, Liev Schreibner's turn as their actual boss was just amazing his best oh, performance yeah. he ever was a leader he, he was and so <laughs> understated and just so like, so perfect so strong he is the one who Same really issues. plants that seed of we're gonna take down the system right and i think him being that perfect leader that sunk in with the spotlights boss mm -hmm. michael michael keaton. keaton yeah and that it in my mind that's where that came from when he thought about it he was like no we're going after the bigger fish mm-hmm well, and it's kind of everyone, beautiful to see everyone that. Everyone is like, they were the idealistic version of who you want them to be yeah, and who we like should be and aligned. who we want. And it like, and it came together to make this story happen that broke, you know? So one thing that I was like looking at with uh, Mark Ruffalo's character when I was watching it was that um, getting into, was he being impatient or not being impassioned on that topic? I was really expecting, and I'm not sure if, the filmmakers wanting to go with it that he too was also sexually molested that I mean, and maybe i mean that's I, that's what i felt like at first when he was just like uh yelling at keaton's character like when he was like you know like we know we've got to print it now and he like started crying and like you know you can see like how much he wants to defend people and i was expecting a little bit in the movie that that would lead into um more revealing with his character but i thought like the characters seem so like crazily impassioned or something like that 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 would have to be some kind of catalyst for him but it but it wasn't and it would be yeah if it was a piece of fiction exactly yeah but it's not but it's not yeah so there's a brilliant character we keep calling them characters but they're real life people and a lot of this from what i've read is very true to real life there's this attorney who is always fighting this uphill battle. He's been doing it for years to try to make the church accountable to its victims. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Mark Ruffalo, when he was on the verge, it was like, just like Michael Keaton took that gem from his boss, mm -hmm. Mark Ruffalo, the journalist, saw the damage and what the attorney was fighting for. And it was like, as a journalist, he became, he took a little bit of their pain, I think. Mm -hmm. It was like that. He had faces to put to the, you know, to the battle and to the injustice. Yeah. And he was on the front lines too, with a lot of it. And I think that's why he was the most like rattled out of everyone else. Cause he, and I think, and he revealed even that, that, that he had a lot taken from him in a, in a spiritual way. Uh, when he was talking with, uh, Sasha, the one, one woman character, I forgot the actress's name. But um, the Rachel McAdams, yeah, Rachel, Rachel McAdams, McAdams. Yeah, yeah, Rachel McAdams. Yeah, she was portraying a uh, solid yeah. performance yeah. as well, all around. Yeah, I liked Rachel McAdams' character, and you know they they had excellent chemistry. Just everyone had chemistry uh, on the en entire movie. The, the only thing I didn't really ever see much was that one guy who had the mustache. I thought he was kind of a meh character. He was kind of a satellite for most yeah. of it. But I don't, I don't. But still, it's not like he did a terrible job. He just didn't. They right. just didn't put. They just didn't. Uh, probably time is a is a factor. Nonetheless, you can't. He can't have his. But well, well, I can't remember what was that uh, that lawyer's name because yeah, he was kind of like an unsung hero kind of thing. Also, right? He yeah. also embodied an ideal of like this tireless grind of almost a thankless fight. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously the people that he's fighting for are thankful, but he's not getting like. 
recognition not, and the even the papers don't really even know about the guy right like no they, and you they can't to an extent his cases are still ongoing mm-hmm. it's not like they want to bring they do want to put a bit of a spotlight on him uh but not specifically it's like yeah he is that unsung hero he's even more of a hero in many ways he's than alone the journalist yeah he's alone he's working on this and it's got it's like sisyphus you're fighting the church you're fighting the vatican and all of the power that they can bring yeah what did he say he was like the vatican thinks in centuries yeah like do you have the time to mm-hmm. fight them kind of thing i was like yeah. oh that's a good line yeah so his character's name was uh mitchell garabedian and it was played by stanley tucci mm-hmm. mm. also solid oh yeah, Stan- just- stanley tucci is always a really good actor but uh he reminded me very much so of the um the night of uh and and just like that lawyer kind of um character the choice of a lawyer who doesn't give up or that social I'm, worker who i'm drawing a blank give up. on his name yeah what i'm, I'm drawing a blank a little bit with that but the um that ideal and kind of getting back to it to where, you know, you went into his office and it was chaos, you know, stacked papers and everything like that. Yeah. He lived, he lived his job and his job defined who he was wholly and fully. And, 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 but he came out as the, the outlier. That was the only reason why he was able to put a spotlight onto the actual <laughs> issue because he was like, Hey, I'm the like only Armenian in Boston. And he's like, so I'm the only person who can see this, who's not really scared or affected by the church and, and everything like that. So that that was also something that it's important to show that you always need that kind of outsider perspective in order to self-examine mm-hmm. many times. And so that it was goes, that was a good mirrored echo like theme that they had throughout it. I yeah. Thought. So they repeated that uh, the whole reason they're on this story is because of the new editor. Mm-hmm. We have Schreibner, who is playing Marty Baron. And he's a Jew in Boston. Uh oh. Which is yeah, it's a Catholic town. Right. And the lawyer's line at one point is it takes a village if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to abuse one. Yes. They don't see the story because they're so close to this system. Mm -hmm. And it's a part of their lives and they're not able to accurately see it for what it is. Yeah. Well and even when Keaton's character is being leaned on by the one um, person from the church. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, you know, he's, he's not from this town. You know, he's like, he's just a Jewish guy who's coming through, just trying to make his mark. He doesn't care about us. And he's going to leave. Yeah. And he's just going to leave. He's like, and then you're not going to leave. What's going to happen to you? Like this kind of like creepy assassination, like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah, it was a total threat. Oh, total threat. Yeah. And a friendly threat. But uh, I think <laughs> it was a very quiet game of chess between two massive powers that dictate everything about most levels of society, the church and journalism. I'd say that journalism, as far as like the states go, like it is also its own, it, it, it's its own country, literally in some places. But very isolated. Very right? isolated. So, <laughs> so we we're talk- hope- well, yeah, but when we're talking about big powers, like this was just a news paper in one town yeah. taking on well did you see the credits the catholic church yeah we all saw the credits okay okay i'm just saying it's, it's like not like the entire world of journalism was fighting you know the oh, catholic church. Okay, it was yeah. just it's a group of people it is just one group of people yeah and what's shocking is yeah at the end of the credits they show you how many cities this took place in you only needed that one group of people to stand up to it mm-hmm. and then because you see it there you can extrapolate and see that they people realize this isn't just Boston, Boston, mm-hmm. old Boston, old Boston. <laughs> but so to go back to, we were talking a little bit about the style being so natural. Music plays a very little role, and part of the reason I think we don't need so many character flaws, we don't need this excess drama that kind of is like one of the pitfalls of the newsroom is that the subject matter itself is just so full of drama. When you hear abuse victims telling their story, it's so easy to make it melodramatic. And I think they toe that line really well, where it's not melodramatic. Mm -hmm. And it goes hand in hand with being kind of a documentary, right? Like, if you're hearing music in something that's actually happening, it has to be 
diegetic or something you know like it can't it has to be in the world Mm -hmm. and so all the president's men and this film for the most part there are exceptions to this but they kind of reserve the music for montages Mm -hmm. that's true there's such a huge emphasis placed on the voice and dialogue that the music would be a distraction you know, except in these sequences where we're just taking us from one place to the other, showing them doing the lake work, going from house to house, mm-hmm. encountering Bostonians, or in the case of all the president's men, they're going around to all the different lower level staffers in the White House or in the RNC who might have been involved. Just thinking about this, this is kind of a going back to characters a little bit. Uh, not that it's a difference between the characters, but like. A little bit of how they're portrayed and how the story is unfolded where in spotlight they it's almost like them just like lifting over every stone kind of thing to find to find out the facts to, to uncover the story where with all the president's men it's almost just like persistence like constantly doing the same thing to get an answer from some you know like they're just way more tenacious in a way mm-hmm. in, in like a it's less of a cerebral thing and more of like a get someone to talk to you kind of thing. Yeah, pound the pavement journalism kind of thing. Right, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's that classic trick that uh, Dustin Hoffman's character mm-hmm. plays. Uh, What's the trick? Wh- where he calls in to the, uh, the front lady's desk. He's oh, trying yeah. to get in to see that attorney. And he calls her off, tells her to come downstairs and get the paper. No, it's like a judge. He's trying to get access to these documents that he called about, and they're trying to ignore him. And so it's like a little uh, detective deal that he does, or like a private detective kind of deal. Mm -hmm. He calls her, gets her off the desk, sneaks right into the office like he had his meeting all planned. It's like, and there's something that we admire about that because we wish in our own lives, I'm going to speak for all of us, that we could go after our goals with that kind of tenaciousness Mm -hmm. and that kind of reckless abandon. Right. And and then that's actually mirrored perfectly in spotlight because Mark Ruffalo's character does the exact same thing when he goes to see the lawyer. Cause he's sitting there, he's waiting to see the lawyer, waiting to see the lawyer. He's like, come back. Yeah. 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 Come back, come back. And then he's like, no, I'm going to go see you now. And the the, uh, front desk gal leaves and then he just pops right in there, opens the door, walks in. And he's like, Hey, what's going on? And he's like, you've been ignoring me. And uh, yeah, we need to get this done. And but I think that's what we want. We want that we want that warrior for truth who has that kind of tireless, just never ending, just that thrum, thrum, thrum of just that tenacious that, that tenaciousness that we just so admire. And yeah. And then getting through that, just you know, you break that boulder by a thousand little hits, not with one big mighty one that would be done with a drama and it shows like just very slowly, and you're like, oh, wow, you weren't destroying it. You were making a beautiful sculpture. That is the truth. <laughs> that so, is the truth. That is the truth. There were... So, these films, they do have a bit of a documentary approach, but there are real instances of design, I would say. Mm-hmm. Like, they've got a couple signature shots for both of them. Cooper, you had brought up that all the president's men made... Bigly use of diopters. Bigly. If not the bigliest. <laughs> That's our new word, by the way. You're probably going to hear it every it's episode. It's not our word. <laughs> it's We're the nation's hijacked. word. Yeah. <laughs> so they had that going on. But for me, what I noticed with Spotlight is they kind of did the reverse of All the President's Men. There are a couple instances in All the President's Men where we're moving in. We're just zooming and zooming and zooming into a conversation. Mm-hmm. With Spotlight, it's like you'll have this really intense dialogue or something that's happening down in their little tiny separate newsroom, and the camera will just track out. Mm -hmm. It'll back up and up and kind of reveal the scope, almost like they're kind of understanding now the actual scope of the story they're covering. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I don't... I'm not quite sure. Often with the diopters, it was like we were supposed to look at two things at once, which is really like, that's what a split diopter does. It was a practical, a practical use, it felt like. Where you could see like a TV monitor in the foreground covering 
that's one of the few instances where you actually get an idea of the politics of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, well, and I think what it was, I think what it was also trying to do is it's so hard in such a large space, such as a newsroom to observe all the factors and everything like that and how it directly pulls to a character. So like when the TV was going or some, something like that, or when they're dialing on the phone that having, um, such a large space that it's, you know, it's impossible to bring how these things are connected. And so it seemed like the diopter was just like the, the go-to kind of thing to just very tightly keep that while not having to sacrifice abandoning that shot. Because so often in all the presidents, men, they try to make shots pretty long. And I mean, to, kind of to my dismay sometimes, like, cause I, I get sometimes bored of the shot, but at the same time I applaud them because it, 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 maintain that realism it maintained that that hey i'm in a newsroom and i'm watching this process happen and this is what's going on and then this happens next it's like watching a cooking show it's like yeah it's not just it pops out of the oven there is a process to this and it made you appreciate their craft Mm -hmm. in that respect you you walked away with or i guess you press stop (laughs) with with uh the notion of you understood what it took to get to the finish line not that they just crossed it I think that's what was great about both of those films. It's so unsexy that it becomes sexy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you got to respect that. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. It's con- it's like confidence in a way. To where it's just like, yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm not done up or anything like that, but I know I'm beautiful. Come at me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This... I know I know I'm interesting. Yeah, exactly. The film knows it's interesting. It knows it's important. What these guys did was important. Yeah. And it's I okay. Mean, it to... was critical. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, it's surrounded in almost myth to the, you know, it's still a huge pop culture today, oh, yeah. right? Like it's... They are the archetypal investigative journalists. Mm-hmm. Woodward and Bernstein. Those are the little guys who took down a president. I mean, just saying Watergate. Everyone has heard that word, Watergate. And if they haven't heard that, they've, they've heard, heard any gate. number yeah, of... <laughs> stupid thing that they've yeah. just thrown gate to the Se- end of. sexting gate <laughs> you know you'll watch your local news deflate like, gate yeah def- yeah <laughs> deflate gate yeah exactly you use gate at the end of it and that means an ex- that's that's the new word for expose or you scandal or, or yeah yeah, yeah, like, yeah it's, it's synonymous with journalism doing a un- uncovering something unseemly or very uncouth or something that was behind hidden doors that did not want to be pulled out into the light. Something that's supposed to be devastating. Yeah. Like it's... And because they've overused it, though, it's kind of lost its power. Well, absolutely. Bigly yeah. Gate? Bigly Gate. <laughs> Russia Gate will be the next yeah, one. As yeah, yeah, kind Ru- of talking yeah about Russia earlier. Gate. Yeah. I'd say Putin Gate would probably be catchier. That sounds like a Canadian dish. Putin Gate? <laughs> <Yeah>. Putin, <laughs> Putin Gate. Yeah, yeah. Putin. <laughs> Putin Gate? Yeah. But yeah, um, but overall, I, I thought those were just nice, consistent themes as far as showing the process of everything. But I also really enjoy cop dramas and the procedural qualities of that. So I think that's why I really did enjoy um, it, both Spotlight and All the President's Men. Um, I think I enjoyed Spotlight a little bit more, probably because it had more of a modern uptick. Uh, they didn't favor wides as much. Uh, but at the same time, All the President's Men seemed much more true to life and true to heart. And I think that's what they were really going after. It wasn't as in terms of you know sexy kind of thing i mean it's just like you can't get so sexy with it with both those movies but i thought like spotlight was much more visually appealing and they were more cross-cutting with their editing and there was um more intrigue whereas with, with the characters like the with... characters carried it more than the plot whereas the plot you were kind of watching like how did this happen and you're kind of watching this like this fuse burn i feel like with all the president's men whereas spotlight was about these characters with the fuse if you, well, if you remember feel, that all the president's that. men, like we were saying, was filmed two years after the fact, right? Two years yeah, after if that, right? It was filmed like this was fresh, yeah, right? So handle with care. Right? Nixon was like, still flying away in the helicopter <laughs> yeah. when they dropped this. He like looked at the poster already. He's like, "Oh come on!" So it was, yeah, it was recent Mm -hmm. and it you know like where spotlight was kind of a story i mean it's recent for sure yeah uh but not that recent and it's 14 15 years right and it's a story that's like yeah we all heard but we didn't quite know exactly what had happened yeah it's still shocking yeah whereas like 
you know, all the president's men, people have been obviously been bogged down for the past three some years, you know, every day on the new, you know, it's like it's in everyone's mind. For mm-hmm. sure. And so another difference between the two, and I think why you felt a little bit less emotionally involved, Coop, mm-hmm. was all the president's men purposefully unsexy and there's really no victim on screen that's true it just follows the journalist it just follows the journalist whereas the journalists in spotlight they have to deal with the actual humans there's like collateral there's a around actual it. yeah emotional cost there's the cost of lives they talk often about the suicides that have occurred because of this mm-hmm or there's actual track marks on their arm you know like they're yeah drug there's they're the lucky ones that lives. are still alive mm-hmm. right it's more say. it's more emotional in just about every yeah. way you're not alive you're tortured and or you're dead you're mm-hmm. living with being tortured with this men- mental scar or yeah like, where a heroin yourself. addict is considered one of the lucky ones yeah whereas so. in all the president's men the victims in that we see are just or i'm not gonna say just but they're people that feel threatened to speak out like they'll be Mm -hmm. not necessarily be harmed but they'll be fired or they'll be yeah prosecuted or something yeah blacklisted or yeah something they're working as staffers they're you know people who know about this going on but they don't want to ruin their whole livelihood even if they do want to speak out about these crimes that were committed Mm -hmm. but the crimes weren't particularly violent they're just corrupt right Mm -hmm. big difference yeah yeah, big difference there. Yeah, and I think it kind of getting to a little bit of a conclusion that it's important that the fourth estate needs to stay both credible and, and you know, adversarial versus these large systems that are a, potentially oppressive to the people. And that, like uh, how I was saying a little bit earlier, uh, you know, that, that's just, you know, my own perspective that for for the people, for people in general, from local news to national that journalism is the tool for us to actually have freedom, uh, for us to actually um, have our opportunity to breathe in, in that regard, that systems of oppression can't crop up. And if they do, that they'll be, they'll have you know, spotlight uh, pointed at them and, and dragged out into the light where they don't want to be and essentially be shunned, shamed, and torn to pieces. They are the only source of knowledge for us to hold representatives accountable in a democracy. If we didn't have that sort of journalism, then you would have no idea what's actually happening behind the closed doors inside a session of Congress. Right. Unless you're going to sit down and watch hours and hours of C-SPAN, which maybe in this alternate universe (laughs) I'm talking about, they don't even have cameras in there. Right. It's just so integral to a democracy. And... Today, it almost feels like we're at kind of... I don't know if we're at a turning point. I don't it's know a crossroads, yeah, for I sure. I feel like we're too close to it to even accurately judge it. Like, things feel like they're changing, though. No, they do, for sure. Well, I mean, okay, so, yeah, how it relates to today, these two movies. Um, just quickly, before we get to our uh, recommendations, which Ooh. I know you guys are excited to hear. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, like, All the President's Men. I think the clear connection is watergate and what's happening in the news with russia and the hacking and the election regardless of facts or validity of the accusations we're in kind of this like you know fervent like quagmire we're in this possibly irresponsibly corrupt time in a way right it could go one of two ways it could be nothing it could be moderately corrupt it could be all sorts of corrupt right and at the same time that is happening, all of the sources who we trust, like the Washington Post, the people who broke the Watergate scandal, are being undermined. Their credibility, exactly. That's the big difference from back then and now is the credibility of the journalists doing the investigations is under attack. Well, now, you can argue unfairly or not. Well, they uh, were being attacked. There's the one scene in All the President's Men where they're being attacked. Same but tactics, all even, of, actually. Yeah, same tactics. Without but saying the, fake news, he practically said, mm-hmm, well, they that, say biased, right? They, or something along that, those lines. Yeah, they're that political they're operatives. Right. That they're not the idealistic, apolitical people that we want them to be. And we're, be, and we're talking we about mean. Nixon's PR, not uh, Trump's right now. But it's exa- saying yeah, that's that. That's hard to figure out. That's hard to figure out because it's very similar, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it, there's a lot of... Uh, 
relatability there, right? They're trying to create gray areas where really there shouldn't be any. Mm -hmm. And you could put blame on both political PR and in a way on, I think, on some of these agencies themselves because we're in a a clickbait. As in media. As in media, yeah, like agencies and media. We're in this and that's how of, the network, how we mentioned earlier, kind of mm-hmm. relates to this, where it's like, you know, once the... Once you put the, that entertainment value in... Yeah, once news organizations are fighting for ratings to survive, where before, you know, the suggestion was your news organization in your network was going to lose money, and you just had to accept that because of the in- integrity of yeah. getting news out to the people. Exactly that. But then, obviously, you get, like, an arms race of, well, once I start getting put a little entertainment in here to get more ratings, people watching mine. Well, now everyone has to do it. And now we've just completely it ballooned. isolated mm-hmm. different parties and deepened divisions between people, you know, in their mm-hmm. own echo chambers. I mean, we can discuss this. It's it's a thing that... You talk about forever. We can talk about forever, and it's been discussed a lot. But so, these movies absolutely relate to that. Uh, oh, yeah. And seeking truth and the ideal and virtues of Well, if I could go honest. on just a a little moment of a diatribe something that i respect so much about the people in spotlight and all the president's men and what we talked about with those characters is they've got the long game in sight Mm -hmm. oftentimes it's like every single news cycle every single day we've got another gotcha moment Mm -hmm. we've caught somebody in a lie we could see what he said now or see what he tweeted now instead of this idea of like wiener yeah anthony wiener yeah Instead of this Weird idea game. of like having your actual sights on the truth, mm-hmm. on the instead of the it, Bernie Madoffs, the hard hitting mm-hmm. journalism, you can't not be the, as not the rating hitting journalism. Yeah, you're wanting the ones that make a change. So, what would you For, say in, in in summation with all these movies and like what you guys have learned? Like, what would you guys say? And like in closing, like ultimately, like how how important is journalism and how important is it that movies like this keep getting made? Well, I don't think I know nearly enough or am eloquent enough to express how absolutely integral this kind of journalism is. I just know the warm, fuzzy feeling I get when I watch these two movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're so fantastic, and I love them for representing the best side, the possibilities of journalism, of truth, of diligence and perseverance in the face of overwhelming odds. It's just got all of these things wrapped up in it that make me giddy. Well, I think I can attest to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay, well, we'll then, I mean, ultimately, so watch All the President's Men. Watch uh, also Spotlight. And below in the information, if you're listening to this on YouTube or anywhere else, we'll put some other good journalism films that uh, we didn't have the opportunity to talk about. But um, like we always do, we always like talk to talk about recommendations. So the recommendation that I would have would be a Netflix, it's original series. It's called Imperial Dream. Uh, it's about this African-American guy who got out of prison. He has a son and he is in the ghetto. And it's all about the struggles that impoverished black communities suffer and just poor people in general suffer with the system working against them and not for them. And it, I've only seen one episode, but honestly, it was eye-opening and captivating with interesting characters. I'm super excited to see where the show is going to go in general and how we were talking about previously how Netflix is now getting into that stage of mass media and it's getting harder and harder to find good Netflix original content in general, like Netflix just used to be before they made original content. And I would say one of the shining bits would be uh, definitely Imperial Dream. I'd highly recommend it. I haven't seen it. Well, we're going to watch it. Okay. How about you, Neil? What's your recommendation? This What's week? on your plate? Oh, uh, my plate? On your plate. Um, well, I'm doing... This is completely unrelated also to uh, our discussion, but a documentary that uh, we saw recently called Rats. The Research and Uncovering of Truth of Rats. Journalism. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, journalism. Uh, oh. But it's uh, Morgan Spurlock's newest film. Uh, same guy that did Super Size Me, if you don't know who that is. Um, and it, it's basically just talking about the infestation our planet has with rats and how we're never going to get rid of them. It's a little bit of doom and gloom and showing how smart rats are and how we basically have no way to fight them. Terrifying. It, oh, it honestly is. No, and it's it a documentary edited 
in a purposefully almost like a horror, but it's a documentary. But mm-hmm. like it's like there's so many bass drops and stuff in it, and mm-hmm. well, it's like the, the, so it's fun as well. It's fun. Oh yeah, yeah. There's like some fun camp to it. I liked it a lot. Like the exterminator that they cut back to every now and then, who's just like sitting in the warehouse on a wooden chair smoking his cigar, and he's like, "You can't kill him. You got to do it with your bare hands." Yeah. He was like, okay. So there was some, like, some fun like camp drama, but I thought ultimately, like, I didn't realize that rats were such a big, big problem. I didn't either. Yeah, it was actually kind of revealing. Yeah, I thought it was very revealing. So yeah, rats. Rats. Because there's an exclamation point, right? At the end? I don't think so. I think oh. it's just rats. So there should have been. Rats. <laughs> oh, rats. Rats. Mm. Kyle, what do you got for us? What's on, what's on your agenda to share with us? My recommendation actually kind of goes along with the style of All the President's Men. Okay. Uh, It's The French Connection, William Friedkin's uh, amazing crime drama, in my opinion. Shot very naturally, handheld. It was unlike anything a lot of people had seen yet. It had a documentary approach to it, a lot of natural light. And what is, I mean, it's an absolute classic, hopefully you've seen it if you haven't then i haven't this is why i'm recommending it it's got a thrilling absolutely thrilling chase sequence that to this day is just we talking bullet level chase sequence way better whoa yeah way better that's a bold claim to me bullet is a little too constructed and especially once you know the backstory of how they did this chase i mean they are physically with the camera in the car barreling along the city streets going something like 80 miles an hour friedkin got in the car with the stunt driver and was like it's just not looking fast enough the dailies are coming back it doesn't look fast enough we've got to actually do it and you can feel it in the movie and there's no music in the sequence but he edited the sequence to a really fast-paced santana song the music doesn't enter at all into the film. There's no mu- It's just this chase sequence. Hmm. But he had that playing like the rhythm of it in the editing room, or so the story goes. That's so fun. Phenomenal That's film. Yeah. yeah, Gene Hackman. Everybody's amazing. It's yeah. That's my recommendation for this week. Hmm. Some solid recommendations, fellas. Yeah. Solid recommendation. Well, as we come to a close, I mean, like always, guys, we really do appreciate you watching. Well, not watching, listening. (laughs) Maybe someday. Maybe someday. I thought about that with YouTube. But uh, thanks for listening, nonetheless, all the way to uh, episode 14. I would say uh, check us out with previous episode. Episode 13, we talked about the best films of 2016. Really give that one a listen. But like always, I've been Cooper Carr. Kyle Montgomery. And Neil Anderson. Thanks a lot, guys. Give us a like. Subscribe. Love you. Bye.